Well, thank you very much for inviting me here to speak today. I think most people now accept the case for environmental sustainability, and I find there, there are two common sentiments that people express. One of those is, okay, so what's, what's coming next? And the other is a sort of sense of dissatisfaction with the term sustainable, which I think Amory Lovins captures pretty well when he says that uh, you know, if you were to ask one of your best friends, how's your relationship with your partner? And they were to say, ah, it's sustainable. You'd probably say, well, I'm really sorry to hear that. And uh, there is something about that word that sort of suggests something that's just about good enough, just about bearable. And over the course of the next 15 minutes, what I hope to persuade you of is that biomimicry actually offers a, a, a very powerful source of new ideas and innovation and, and the potential to go beyond uh, sustainable and to achieve restorative uh, ways of, of designing things, re regenerative solutions. So biomimicry is about looking to nature as a source of inspiration for new solutions. And I'm going to show some examples of how biomimicry can be used to rethink existing building types and also develop new building types. So let's start with uh, the uh, office building type. This, this is a concept study that we did for a, a client in Switzerland. And uh, we persuaded him to let us do this concept study before uh, a site had been chosen, uh, before the brief had been set, to keep the constraints to an absolute minimum. And we also persuaded him to let us appoint the team. And we adopted an approach a bit like that film, The Magnificent Seven, where we chose the very best people we could find, a sort of black belt engineer and, and champion knife thrower and so on. Um, and uh, we went through quite a process of, of workshops uh, with this fantastic consultant team, looking at all the main um, elements of an office building, the, the structure, the way you bring daylight in, the temperature control, the skin, the energy, and so on. And um, we concluded that actually it was the daylight that is the most powerful uh, driver of, of architectural form if, if you're to create a very low energy, very high performing building. And um, daylight is a kind of precondition for pretty much all forms of, of life on the planet. So it's not surprising that there are some very ingenious examples of how light is gathered in nature. So this first one here that I'm drawing is a, is a, a fish called a spook fish, which has these amazing mirror eyes which focus very low levels of, of bioluminescence um, and focus those onto the retina. And then another example, uh, this time from a desert, is the stone plant. And most of the plant is actually below the ground uh, for reasons of thermal control. And then it has this kind of roof light that uh, brings the light down to the photosynthetic matter uh, in the base of the plant. And uh, my favorite one is, is actually a, a, the brittle star, which is a starfish that lives about 500 meters below the ocean surface where light levels are very, very low. And what it's evolved is this uh, skin covering of almost optically perfect lenses which focus light onto photoreceptors. And by doing that, it's able to detect a predator long before uh, the, the predator sees it. So, uh, that, that's the brittle star and showing its, its, its lenses. And these, these really encouraged us to be much more deliberate and much more inventive with the way that we brought daylight into the office building. And um, a common way to design for daylight is to, to look at the floor depths and, and work out what the optimum floor depth is for the office building. In, in U, the UK, it's quite common to find floor depths of 25 or even 30 meters. And with a situation like that, you're very reliant on artificial lighting, and it's almost certain to be uh, air-conditioned. And we concluded that the, the right floor depth was, was probably about 12 meters, so no more than about 6 meters from the nearest window wall. And then thinking about what kind of building form that suggested, uh, one form could be a, a sort of tower with quite narrow floor plates. Now, that would be suitable to a, a dense urban environment, but we were uh, in a sort of slightly out of urban location. So we looked at some lower rise versions, uh, one of which was this sort of donut arrangement where you have the floor plates arranged around a central atrium. Um, and then a third one was uh, one where you have these two linear blocks uh, arranged around a, a central atrium. And that was the one that seemed to work the best in terms of optimizing the daylight in those, in those floor plates. The next stage was to uh, analyze quite carefully what the light did. Um, and we found that you actually got a slightly lower level of light in the middle of those floor plates because of the, the shading effect of the opposite building. So the next move was to bend those floor plates so that we could get a very even level of light all the way along. Now, the problem with that was that it didn't particularly suit a rectangular site. 
um, which we're likely to, to need, um, or likely to end up with. And also, it doesn't work particularly well for, for clusters of people. For good cooperation in buildings, you need a clustering of people. So the next move was to develop those plan forms into these kind of undulating forms, so that no part of the building was further than about six or seven meters from the nearest window. And now we were getting much better potential for clustering uh, of people within that building. And then looking at, at how the building worked in section, uh, there was uh, an abundance of daylight towards the top and a deficit of daylight at the bottom. So we, the next move was to sort of taper the building forms to allow, building to, uh, to, to allow light to come deeper down into the building. And there was even the potential to, to try and harvest light uh, from, the, from the top where there was an excess and, and put that into fiber optic tubes and conduct it down to the base. And here we were inspired by a plant called Anthurium waraquinum, which is quite similar to the brittle star in that it has lenses all over its surface. It's evolved to live in very low light levels in the base of a rainforest. Um, so that was the building form, these, these, ta these tapered buildings. Uh, and, and we put in the middle uh, this uh, large-scale light reflector that would bounce light deeper into the floor plates. And then underneath that, we realized there was an opportunity to create really quite a dramatic meeting room space. So we were getting a, 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 a double benefit. It was working as a light reflector, and underneath, we had this uh, meeting space, which had some of the dramatic qualities of uh, Ken Adam designed film sets, like this one for Dr. Strangelove. Um, and one of the big advantages of designing for daylight is that it's then possible to, to use a whole uh, range of plants as uh, uh, space dividers. And NASA did some work on these three plants, and apparently these can deal with nearly all the main contaminants that occur in office spaces. One of those produces a lot of oxygen during the day, one produces oxygen at night, uh, and the, the, the last one, the areca palm, that actually takes out a lot of volatile organic compounds, and all three are very good at taking dust levels down. And in a, an experiment in India, they found they were achieving 20% increases in productivity, as well as a lot of other health benefits. So then, moving on to the structure, um, the, the way we use biomimicry here was really to optimize the strategic forms that have been determined by daylight. The daylighting was the most important thing. Uh, so here we were trying to use uh, biomimicry to, to make that structure as, as efficient as possible. And um, you could characterize the way that materials are used in nature by saying that in nature, materials are expensive and design is cheap. And so what you find is a lot of examples of really quite complex forms that use a minimum of materials very, very efficiently. So this uh, drawing I'm, I'm sketching here, this is actually uh, a section through a bird's skull where you have very, very thin layers of, of bone connected by a, a mass of struts and ties. So it's like a combination of, of dome technology and space frame technology, and all that in a, in a humble little garden bird. Um, another example we looked at was the, the main bone that you find in a cuttlefish, uh, which is actually quite similar. Again, you get these very thin layers of bony material with sort of undulating walls that connect those together and form a, a rigid structure. So th those two inspired us to try and think about uh, an office building in a more efficient way. And we analyzed a fairly generic uh, arrangement of, of columns and, and floor slabs and looked at where the material was, was really working hard and where it was, was uh, not really so, so necessary. And there are quite a lot of areas that are actually redundant. The material is just not doing anything. So if we follow the form that the, the structure wants to be, we end up with something roughly like this. So we get uh, deeper sections where you need it. We actually end up with hollow columns and we form uh, hollow voids in the floors. So then we can use air to, to, uh, to mobilize the structure, not just for structural benefits, but also for thermal control benefits. Uh, that brings us on to the next one, which is temperature control or thermoregulation. And we saw in that structural example that structures can be made more efficient by making them hollow. And hollow structures in nature often serve a, a dual purpose uh, for conducting services around the organism, uh, so, for instance, in the case of our spinal columns, we have very long nerve cells uh, which communicate around our body. And the opportunity that this uh, brought up was the potential to connect into the, the ground underneath the building. And that's a, a very common thermoregulation technique in, in nature. Uh, a lot of animals have, have adapted to make um, underground burrows so that it, it controls the temperature uh, and moderates it to maybe sort of plus or minus uh, four degrees C all year round. And the, the really accomplished masters of this are the termites. 
uh, which have developed uh, solar-powered air conditioning, and in the royal chamber in the middle, the temperature varies by as little as half a degree C, even though outside is changing by as much as uh, 40 degrees C over the course of the day. So the ideal was to create a network of pipes in the ground underneath the building and then use the hollow columns to connect that up into the building and, and use that free cooling and free heating to control uh, the temperature inside. Uh, the, the last bit I'm going to talk about is the skin. And here we use biomimicry to try and ident identify the ideal solution, which was to uh, optimize daylight both for health benefits and minimum energy uh, reasons. Uh, now, daylight varies very widely uh, from naught to maybe 20,000 lux, and we need more moderate levels inside. So the solution we developed was this, this kind of skin of photovoltaic leaves, which are controlled by a movement mechanism, so they can move between either down or up to control the light, and that's based on the mimosa pudica plant. Uh, so again, a very efficient system based, based on nature. And uh, that, that scheme, which we're now working on in the next stage, uh, it, it's close to entirely uh, daylit, uh, almost entirely self-heating and self-cooling. It's ultra-low energy, and the air coming out would be cl cleaner than the air going in. I'm going to briefly touch on two more projects uh, just in the last couple of minutes. One of these is, is in Norway. Uh, it's a, a data center inside a, a mountain. And uh, as you probably know, data centers use a lot of energy, and that's mostly for cooling. So a simple uh, strategy you can use is to put it somewhere very cool. And that's what nature does. If it's too hot, it moves somewhere cool. Uh, so this is proposed for inside a mountain, uh, which is already uh, carved out for marble mining. And uh, security was a really big deal here. So we decided to try and create something sort of the theatrical out of the experience of, of a visitor coming into this, use uh, lighting to really emphasize the drama of, of this journey down the cave, um, and then getting into a boat to cross the underground lake, ending up at this uh, showpiece server uh, that would be right in the middle of the mountain. And you might be wondering, well, how do you use uh, biomimicry to, to design a, a data center? You don't get data centers in nature. Uh, but as I said, the, one of the main uh, uses of energy is, is in cooling. Now, we've got a free source of cooling, but we still need to move quite a lot of air around. And in nature, there's a principle called Murray's Law, uh, which you can find in a lot of uh, branching vessels like leaves and blood, uh, blood capillaries and so on. And uh, that Murray's law determines the ratio of the diameters between branching vessels and also the angles. And it appears to be an optimum energy solution. So rather than developing a, a rectilinear arrangement of these data blocks, uh, we arranged it as a circular cluster, so we have an absolute minimum of ductwork, a minimum of bends, and a minimum of energy as well. And that's roughly how it might look, uh, the, the, the data center that you come to, the showpiece one, uh, once you've uh, been down this uh, cave, uh, get, got into your boat to cross the underground lake and so on. It was totally James Bond, I know, but uh, it actually shows that sustainability can be fun as well as uh, super low energy. Uh, th there is a tendency for sustainable design to be a bit sort of dull and worthy, but I think it is possible to create really inspiring solutions that make people feel positive about the future. And uh, that, that brings me on to the, the last project, the Sahara Forest Project, which we've been working on with the Bologna Foundation, and uh, they've been absolute heroes on this project. They've really uh, accelerated us forward, uh, assisted in uh, securing funding, and so on. And I think a, a big part of the solution to our energy challenges of the future uh, lie in rethinking deserts. And a lot of the world's deserts were actually vegetated a very short time ago, as little as hundreds or uh, a few thousand years ago. This shows photosynthetic activity around the world over the course of a number of years. And what you can see is that the, the boundaries of those deserts actually uh, vary quite a lot over the course of each year, which raises the question of whether we could intervene at those boundary conditions to halt or even reverse desertification. And if you're working in an extreme environment, there's a lot that you can learn from the organisms that have already adapted to that. And uh, this is one of my heroes, the Namibian fog basking beetle which has evolved a way of harvesting its own fresh water in a desert. And the way that it does that is that it comes out of its hiding place at night, crawls to the top of a sand dune, and because it's got that, this matte black shell, it's able to radiate heat out to the night sky and become slightly cooler than its surroundings. And um, just before sun, well, because it's cooler, uh, when the moist breeze blows in off the sea, you get these droplets of water forming on the beetle's shell. Just before the sun comes up, it tips its shell up, the water runs down to its mouth, has a good drink, goes off and hides for the rest of the day. 
Not a great quality of life, but a clever trick. And um, the ingenuity, if you could call it that, goes even further, because on the back of the beetle's shell, there are a whole series of little bumps, which are hydrophilic. They attract water. And between them, there's a waxy finish which repels water. And the effect of this is that as the droplets form on the bumps, they stay in very tight spherical form, which means they're much more mobile than they would be if it was just a film of water over the whole beetle's shell. So it's able to harvest that water very efficiently and channel it down to its mouth. And uh, that inspired us to develop these, these greenhouses, uh, which use the evaporation of seawater to cool them and then create fresh water. And really, the core of this project is about creating a symbiotic uh, cluster between those uh, saltwater greenhouses and concentrated solar power. And when you bring those two together, they're actually much more efficient than they would be by themselves. And uh, there's even the potential to use the shade under those mirrors to grow crops that would not normally grow in desert regions. And uh, what that scheme is, really, is it's a, is a model for how we, could, how we could create clean energy and zero carbon food in some of the most water stressed parts of the planet, as well as revegetating areas of desert. And a lot of the inspiration for that came from that, that simple beetle. And just to conclude now, what I think these projects have in common is not just a respect for nature, but also a commitment to creating a positive future. And I really think that's an important point. We can choose to let the future happen to us, or we can choose to shape it. We can decide on the future we want and then set about creating it. I think it's clear that we can't rely on governments to sort out the problems of the environment. So it falls to people like us, people like you and people like me. And I firmly believe that if entrepreneurs and innovators and investors and environmentalists, if we work together, we could astonish the gods with what we could achieve. Thank you very much.